Now, before we begin today's session, us at NYU just want to make sure you and your family are safe and well during this time. We're so thankful you've chosen your afternoon and um, spending some time learning more about the collective knowledge of our NYU community. The NYU Alumni Association represents nearly 600 alumni from all over the world. On average, we host nearly 700 events a year to connect you with the NYU community as well as the alumni community. In light of the current global crisis, we moved our programming to um, online. So today's uh, session features my co-host, Iris Fernandez, Associate Director at ISA, and our main presenter, Claire Fitzgerald, Associate Director for Exhibitions and Gallery Curator at ISA. If you have any questions during the session, please enter them in the question box on your screen. If we have time at the end of the program, we'll get to as many questions as, as possible. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Now it's my pleasure to welcome my wonderful co-host, Iris. Iris, take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, I hope you're all holding up well and staying safe inside. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. And thank you, Michelle, for setting this all up. Uh, as Michelle mentioned, I'm the development associate at ISA. And um, I'm happy to be here today and happy to be here with Claire and all of you. Uh, I just want to reiterate, I do see some questions coming in already, which is wonderful, and we will be answering them at the end. So if you can be a little patient, we'll get to them all at the end. So for those of you who don't know, ISA is a graduate school and research institute of NYU located in the Upper East Side by the Metropolitan Museum of Art and NYU's Institute of Fine Arts, if you guys are more familiar with the IFA. We are also very proud to have our exhibitions program, <clears throat> which is what brings everyone here today. We usually put on about one to two exhibitions a year that are regularly covered by the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Hypoallergic, and more. So please come check us out next time we're all able to, which hopefully will be sooner than later. As the most visual and public part of ISA, our exhibitions play a crucial role in furthering ISA's mission to foster interest in and understanding of the interconnected civilizations of antiquity. Uh, with this in mind, our current exhibition, A Wonder to Behold, Craftsmanship in the Creation of Babylon's Ishtar Gate, explores ancient ideas about craftsmanship and the power of clay, glass, and stone through the display of the surviving fragments of Babylon's iconic Ishtar Gate and processional way. I always like to say that this exhibition aims to take the Ishtar Gate out of art history and put it back into the world of archaeology to see just what we can still learn about it. Though I leave the full explanation to the expert, uh, my colleague, Claire Fitzgerald, the Associate Director for Exhibitions and Gallery Curator at ISA. Before inter introducing her, I wanna really quickly mention that although I am not an NYU, NYU alumna myself, I did study abroad with NYU and actually ISA uh, in Egypt back in 2009, so uh, NYU pride. Claire, however, my uh, wonderful colleague, is actually a 2004 graduate of NYU's College of Arts and Sciences, so. Props to them. Claire came to ISA with a background in both curatorship and education. She holds a PhD in art history from Emory University. As an Egyptologist, she has a particular interest in the definition of space through image and identity in funerary culture. She has held a number of fellowships, including at the American Research Center in Egypt and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She has curated exhibitions and permanent installations on a wide array of topics and collections, both ancient and modern, and teaches museum methodology and practice at ISA. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Claire as she takes us into the galleries. Thank you so much, um, Iris and Michelle, and thank all of you for joining us here today. Again, I, um, I wish that we were together in the galleries and our goal today is going to be to try as much as we can to approximate that experience in the galleries. Um, I saw is built on the idea that we can always learn new things from the ancient world and that through an approach that is both cross-cultural and interdisciplinary, we can, we can always be expanding our understanding of the ancient world. So I'll talk about how this exhibition in particular um, seeks to do that. And again, I'll be happy to answer questions at the end, but I'm so happy that all of you are here. So here. Of course, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be um, 
<laughs> it wouldn't be a webinar if there wasn't some problems. So I'm having a little bit of difficulty advancing the slides. There we go. <laughs> so as Iris um, shared, the exhibition takes as its jumping off point, the Ishtar Gate, um, which for many of us is known principally through its reconstruction in the Vorder Asiatisches Museum, which is in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. Now, the Ishtar Gate is a monument that is really an icon of ancient art. Any, um, any book you pick up that deals in any way with ancient Middle Eastern culture will have a big, beautiful image of the Ishtar Gate. And so one of the ways that we sort of approach exhibitions that I saw is to either seek to bring people um, material from the ancient world that they haven't seen before, from either parts of the ancient world they haven't seen before or periods they haven't seen before. This exhibition is quite different. What we sought to do here was to take a very different look at a very familiar object. Um, that was a bit intimidating, certainly, and um, I have to, um, you know, give thanks to my co-curators, Anastasia Amrain and Elizabeth Knott, who are um, ancient Middle Eastern specialists, and we were able to really um, think about this monument. The Ishtar Gate was created as the major ceremonial entrance to the city of Babylon. Um, it was constructed during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar II, who reigned from about 604 BCE to 562 BCE. Now, the thing that it, we have to understand about this monument is that it, it really mediated an, a visitor's experience of the city. And so it was constructed to send certain messages about not only Nebuchadnezzar himself, but also the Neo-Babylonian Empire, and also sort of its longer, its longer history in ancient Middle Eastern culture. So it, it was extremely important as a, um, again, a mediator for those who would enter the city of Babylon. Now, because it is such a huge and imposing monument, um, we experience it as a whole. The way it's reconstructed, we experience it as a massive sort of installation. And one way to change the way we might think about this monument was to take it back to its pieces, to think about it in terms of how it was constructed and what the materials and the process of making this monument really added to its meaning. And so those are some of the things that we look at in this exhibition. If you've never been to ISA right now, you're looking at our entryway. So um, we have two galleries that um, fall off this, um, this space. And what we're standing in front of right now, um, sort of in a imaginative sense, is a crate. Now, the story of, of the monument of the Ishtar Gate is, of course, also a story of archaeology. And um, what we see here is that, um, oh dear, sorry. Um, what we see here is that, um, I'm so sorry, I'm having some difficulty advancing. There we go. <laughs> oh, went too far. Um, what we see here is a crate filled with fragments. Now, the Ishtar Gate was not really, um, was not really known very widely or, or at all until excavation began there in 1899. Um, the Deutsche Orientgesellschaft, or the DOG, um, a German archaeological organization, went to Babylon in order to look for the remains of this great city. Now, interestingly, Babylon in and of itself is a place that is connected to a lot of different ideas for us. Um, ideas that come from the Bible, ideas that come from ancient history, and even sort of the word Babylon calls to mind a lot of ideas. The British Museum, when they were preparing for an exhibition that dealt with Babylon, 
noted that during a survey, most people didn't know that Babylon was a real place. They thought it was an idea. They thought that it was a biblical sort of place, but not a real archaeological site. And so I think what that speaks to is the fact that the ancient world can attach itself to so many different ideas. And when we look at it, we have to try to prize apart what some of those different ideas are that it's come to sort of encompass. Now, when the Germans went to Babylon, the site of Babylon was known. It was known that the, it sat at the Tigris and the Euphrates, um, and that but there were huge mounds there of mud brick. In this part of the ancient Middle East, mud brick was the primary building material. And so the challenge with mud brick is that it is always trying to become mud again. And so instead of having huge stone, huge stone remnants, we're looking at mud brick remnants. Now, this box is one of the boxes that was sent between Babylon and Berlin around 1903. In 1903, 399 boxes filled with fragments were the first shipment that came from Babylon to Berlin. Far more came in, um, far more came in a second shipment, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Hmm. Oh dear. Pardon me. I mean, you know what I'm going to do? It seems like someone else has better control of the slides, so I'm just going to say next slide. <laughs> that way I won't have to struggle with it. Um, so when we, are in, um, when we are in the galleries, this is our first gallery. As you can see, we decided to sort of try to evoke the colors of the Ishtar Gate, which you'll note are this beautiful deep, deep blue and golden, along with turquoise and these really brilliant colors. When we designed the gallery, we were thinking about how to give a sense of the environment of Babylon. And so we have this sort of um, sand colored wall with the blue at the top that's sort of meant to evoke the sky. And, the, and one of the purposes of that was to try to re, um, reactivate the way that those colors would have interacted with the environment. So if we go to the next slide, um, we can continue. Pardon. So first we're gonna look at where the Ishtar Gate was. So the city of Babylon was a walled city and you can see here the central, um, the central walled part of the city. The Ishtar Gate was the main, certainly ceremonial thoroughfare that led into the city. What you see here is that it is, um, the Ishtar Gate is preceded by a, cer a, a processional way, which was a 230 meter um, way with large, tall walls. So you would have walked toward the gate via this sort of causeway. If you continued walking, you would have hit the real center, the, the ritual center of the city, which was the ziggurat. And so in terms of creating the experience for the viewer and the visitor to Babylon, this installation was incredibly important. So we can go on to the next slide. Thank you. So here we get, um, here we get a sense of what this might have looked like in the, in, in 600, 500 BCE. You can see that the Ishtar gate is the gate in the, in the front here. It has um, animals represented on it, bulls and mushushu dragons, and I'll introduce who those figures are in a moment. But you really get a sense that this is part of a huge network of mud brick walls made out of hundreds of thousands of bricks. These walls actually extended deep into the earth, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But what this is meant to do, of course, is to really give you a sense of how you would approach the city. This piece is actually a reconstruction of the gate done probably just after the excavators returned to Berlin. And what's amazing to us as current archeologists is how much work was done with no, with, with really sort of 
rudimentary photography, without all the digital tools we rely on so much today. And so all of these excavation records are beautiful objects in and of themselves because they're objects, they're, they're art that's created with pen and pencil and paper. And so they're beautiful, but they're also hugely informational. And so we'll see more examples of that as we go through. Here we go. So when you, um, when excavators arrived at the site of Babylon, there were, they were confronted with 20 meter high ruins of mud brick. And those are the things that you can see that look like large hills in the back here. These ruins had on their surface some small fragments with glaze on them. Glaze is a vitreous material, so a glass-like material, which coated the mud bricks and served not only to weatherproof them and make them more durable, but of course also provided color and an opportunity to, to embellish the gate with iconography. So the first, the, they sort of began this, this excavation just based on some really small, maybe not terribly impressive fragments, and then we're able to uncover this massive and hugely important monument as a result, which archaeologically speaking is extremely lucky. For a lot of us who spend time in the field, you spend way too much time with undecorated pottery shirts. So to find yourself sitting on something like this had to have been an incredible experience. Of course, the site of Babylon is quite large, so rail cars had to be built in order to transport material around, and that's something that you, you see here in this image. We can go to the next slide. As excavation went on, they uncovered not only the fragments of the gate which sat, the, the blue Ishtar gate which sat above ground in the ancient period, but also a massive network of subterranean um, walls. And that's what we see here. These were unglazed mud brick that had much of the same iconography as that on the gate that was visible, but these extended down deep into the ground. There are different ideas about why maybe such these were these existed. Some suggest that they were meant to project the sort of ritual protection of the gate down into the earth. Some people think that they were a sort of early iteration of the gate that was developed over time. Um, we don't know know for sure, but these, these, these part of the ruins gives us the closest idea of what the Ishtar gate looked like when it was, when it was visible in ancient Babylon. And you can still see all of these walls today in Babylon. So we can head to the next slide. Now, I mentioned that one of the ways that the power of Babylon was represented was not only through sort of the lavishness and the scale of this monument, but also through iconography. And that's what we see here. I mentioned that on the gate itself, you had, you had dra Mushushu dragons and bulls. Mushushu dragons, um, as you see represented here, are one of these wonderful composite beasts that we have from the ancient world. So this is where someone takes all of sort of the scariest aspects of creatures that they know and sort of mushes them together. And the Mushushu dragon is the result of that. So what you see here is the Mushushu dragon has lion forepaws, um, raptor or bird of prey back paws, um, a snake, a snaky head um, with a forked toe, and also a scorpion tail. So while in some ways he may look kind of at least to me, I find him kind of lovable. He was sort of a terrifying protective beast. And people in ancient Babylon, we find actually images of Mushushu dragons on small, um, small plaques which people dedicated in their homes, um, had used as votive objects. And so this was, an, this was a, a, an image that would have been familiar and so very legible and personal to people who encounter the gate. So we can go on to the next. This is a reconstruction of what the, what the gate looked like in, the ancient, in, in ancient Babylon. This is one of the pieces that was probably done on site in Babylon as excavations were happening. And what 
it's wonderful when you see it in person, is you get to see how there are little pinpricks in, in the edges where they, where they held down the paper as it was blow, as they were blowing around. They, these are works of art which in some ways are fanciful because as I stated, none of this part of the gate was standing. So some of this is conjecture but also it's based on not only excavation of the site, but also parallels that are found elsewhere. Um, I hope so much that we have an opportunity to open the gallery again and that you get to spend some time looking closely at these objects because um, they're just, the, the level, how meticulous they are is just really spectacular. <laughs> we can go to the next. <laughs> So when all of those crates of fragments were brought from ba Babylon to Berlin, the major thing that had to happen with them is that they be desalinated. When objects are in the ground for some time, the salts in the earth leach into them, causing them often to be unstable. And so one of the first things that you do is you try to pull the salts out of the objects. Now, working on this scale was something that really was sort of unprecedented, not to use a word that we're so familiar with right now. But what we see here is they actually used beer vats in order to pull the salts out of these fragments in the museum. And so that's the first image you see um, on your left. On your right, you see how the excavator started to simply by sort of raw hours spent, separate each of these fragments into different groups so that they could then begin to assemble individual bricks and then assemble panels and then assemble larger, um, larger installations of panels. So one of the things that's kind of hard for us to wrap our mind around is just what a big project this was to reconstruct and understand this monument just from fragments. What, we, what this process yielded was not only the reconstruction in Berlin, but also it gives us a really wonderful sense of what it meant to, to create this monument initially. And so that's a major part of what we look at in this exhibition. We can go to the next slide. <laughs> So this is, the, this is the installation as it appears today in Berlin. What you'll notice is, is that the animals are all ancient, ancient fragments. Built around them, this, many of these blue bricks are actually modern bricks. So not all of the material was assembled to get, that assembled was ancient. And in fact, there was a, um, a sort of competition within Germany to find who would make the glazed bricks that would fill out this. And so these are also sort of, um, you know, made in the 1920s. And so now themselves have sort of become this composite monument, not only about ancient craftsmanship, but also modern craftsmanship. So we can continue. One of the things that, that the, this exploration yielded was an understanding of how you organized such a magnificent and complex building program. And in order to create a glazed wall with iconography, you have to first bake the molded bricks, the, the plain mud brick, mud brick bricks, <laughs> and then you have to apply paint or what is a scent which is glaze so a vitreous paint and then fire it again so you have to take bricks in and out of their organization and they have to go back exactly where they where they came from in order to do that the babylonian the neo babylonians used this system of fitters marks so what you see here is how they made sure that the bricks went back where they belonged you can see that on the end of each brick is a unique symbol and you would match that symbol with the one next to it. So they, and then the central symbol in the middle of the brick indicated which course that brick belonged to. Again, we have to think about this process happening with hundreds of thousands of bricks. And it really gives us a, a, an appreciation of the fact that this monument didn't just sort of magic itself out of thin air, but in fact was an extremely organized and thoughtful construction. We can go to the next slide. So another question is then, we recognize that just the, that the construction of this gate was a tremendous 
um, enterprise, um, financially, um, manpower wise, materials wise. And here we have a, an object which speaks to why um, why an, a, a king would engage in this. When we talk about ancient history, so often it is the story of kings, um, the highest level of elite that we know. We know a lot less often about what people, sort of for lack of a better word, regular people were doing in the ancient world, depending on the time period. But what we see is that Nebuchadnezzar wanted you to see the gate and think of him. He wanted you this to be a statement of his own power, of his own piety, of all of these important things. And what we see here is a stela, not of Nebuchadnezzar II, but of Ashurbanipal. And the reason that this is a really important object, outside of it being beautiful, and I wish you could see it in person, um, is that it represents the king taking part in a millennia-old ritual, which we know Nebuchadnezzar II would also have engaged in. And what he's doing is he's holding on his head a basket of earth, like a worker. And so what this ritual said, does is the king takes a basket of earth, forms the first brick of an important monument or temple, and therefore becomes this sort of, um, this, the actual creator of that building. Now, of course, um, if Ashurbanipal or Nebuchadnezzar made one brick, that was probably the only brick they, they ever made. Um, so we're not saying that, you know, they were, you know, in any way sort of um, sweating at the site. However, when texts that they produced do talk about, I am the, I made, I made and had made bricks. I did all of these things. So they, at the same time as they're really promoting themselves as the sole creator of this material, um, in, t in order to do so, they have to take on the identity of a physical worker. I love this piece too, because there's a text um, actually associated with Nebuchadnezzar's father, where he talks about taking part in this ritual. And he says, I had bricks made as numerous as the rains from heaven. And he then says, and I bent my head to take the basket on my head in front of the god Marduk. And so what he's doing there is he's connecting, he's connecting himself physically by bowing his head and taking on a burden to those who created the gate. Now, if we go to the next slide, we'll see what we can learn maybe a little bit more about other people who were involved in the creation of the gate. So here we have two bricks. Now, I know that mud bricks might not at first be the most exciting things that you've ever, you've ever seen, but they hold a lot of really important information for us. And what you see on both of these bricks, which come from Babylon, is a stamped inscription in Akkadian. So these are the cuneiform inscriptions, which you see running in the center of these blocks. These inscriptions talk, uh, list Nebuchadnezzar's name, his accomplishments, his titles. So he actually is impressing his identity into each block. Now these, these parts of the block would not be visible in the wall itself, it's on the top of the brick. So you wouldn't see them. So Nebuchadnezzar is thinking of an audience that is either the future audience, meaning us, or a divine audience. But the other thing that you'll notice on these bricks is that we see a different type of writing as well. And that is this script writing, which you see very visible in the brick on the left, and then also stamped on the brick on the right. These are alphabetic inscriptions, likely Aramaic, um, and they seem to be um, either the names of, of perhaps people who were working on the gate, perhaps areas that these bricks were destined for. And so what we see here is the sort of um, the big history story that Nebuchadnezzar wants us to see, which is his inscription, and then also an indication of the people who are actually working. And we have those linguistic differences. One was supposed to be functional and the other was supposed to be ritual. We can go to the next um, slide. Okay, so when you're in the gallery, um, we try to approximate how you would experience um, the lion itself. And 
So this, as you came into the city of Babylon, um, you would be confronted um, by, you would be joined sort of on your walk in that causeway by 120 glazed molded lions. And that's what we see one example of here. So as you're walking into Babylon, on either side, 60 of these almost life-size lions. Now, as you're walking into the city, if we can go to the next slide, I'll, I'll, I can you can see this even more closely. Um, you can see that you would be walking into the snarling mouth of the lion. So you would be the, you would be really um, clear that you were sort of entering a space that was highly protected, that was very powerful. Um, as you walked out of the city, you would be joined by these lions walking in the same direction. And so they would sort of be, um, you would sort of be cloaked in their protection. Again, these thoughts about how one would experience these monuments was extremely important in terms of creating an expectation and understanding of the monument itself. So we can go to the next slide. The other, so we have this understanding now of how impressive, um, it, how impressive this monument was, how important it was to the identity of the king into Babylon. But another thing that we might not initially think about is how materials worked in this environment. So in this second gallery, we deal with the question of materials. And so we can go to the next slide. <laughs> So today, of course, um, when we have, when we think about value and material, um, we tend to privilege um, those things that are natural and not man-made. And I think, I'm thinking, of course, and you know, like um, my cubic zirconia ring is not as important or as valuable as your diamond ring. Um, we privilege these things for their rarity. Um, and also often for the diff their difficulty in mining and things like that. And we make associations with them because of their origin. When I was first taught about the Ishtar Gate a um, long time ago, there was sort of this idea that, um, you know, the Ishtar Gate is this brilliant blue glaze because it was meant to look like lapis lazuli this very valuable stone, which was mined in Afghanistan, which you see an example of at the top. So the idea sort of went that, you know, well, let's say the king had enough, had a ton of, had more lapis lazuli, he would have built it out of that, but instead he used glaze. And this was meant to be sort of imitative and um, maybe not sort of tricking the visitor, the viewer, but to sort of evoke that. Now, that does isn't that idea is not borne out so much in the ancient records and it, and it suggests something of how we take the things that we believe now and and sort of apply them to the way that we look at the ancient world so in um in ancient babylon lapis lazuli was a valuable material so was glass which we see here again a man-made material or egyptian blue Faience. These are all different types of vitreous materials, glass-like materials, which were um, which were made and had associations of their own, which were really important. And their their role was not just to be imitative. So we'll talk about that in the next um, slide. But I wanted to give you a sense of how similar a lot of these materials look. So one of the ways that we know that um, you know vitreous materials weren't simply a cheap substitute for something more valuable is through text. These are two um, cuneiform tablets, which we are very fortunate to have in the galleries. Um, both of them are what we would call glass recipes. So in order to make glass, um, you know, we think of recipes as something where we add a cup of flour, we had, you know, a half cup of sugar to something. Um, and while some of that information is embedded in these texts, they aren't simple recipes. In fact, they talk about how the process of making glass is associated with alchemy and is associated with ideas about sort of transformational magic. And so 
one of the things that has to be done in order to successfully make glass was to identify an auspicious day in the calendar during which to do it, to orient your kiln vis-a-vis -vis various gods, to make offerings to those gods. And so it's not that, um, there, that glass making was seen as a simply technical sort of scientific process. In fact, it was, in, it was engaged in notions of creation, which in and of themselves had, were embedded with ideas of the divine. So to be a creator was not simply to be a technician. Not that there's, not that, you know, I, I see even in my own language, I do it. Um, but this is a really important point. The other thing that we find is that when we look at sort of the most um, high level, high status, precious objects in the ancient, in the ancient Middle East, things like the cult statues. We see glass and lapis lazuli and these different materials used in concert with one another. And so the other thing that we can think about is what each of these materials brought to the meaning of an object, not simply beyond their aesthetics. So we can go to the next slide. This is um, every time we do exhibitions, of course, all of us have objects that are our favorites. If um, I, you know, um, I joke that there's always one object that I would take home with me and this, this for this exhibition is that object. So we talked a little bit about the meaning of the treatise materials and vis-a-vis -vis natural materials. Um, but this extends also to materials that we may sort of think very little about and that would be clay or you know the actual so the actual fabric of the city itself is clay mud um and that that we might just think again well if they had stone they would have done it or clay is easier to work with but we see instead that there is meaning bound up in the material of clay in um in many um, ancient Middle Eastern creation stories, people are fashioned out of clay, um, either by mixing the blood of the gods with clay and forming people. Um, people are made with molds. Um, and so this material itself is related to ideas of generation. Um, this object here, which I love so much, is a figurine mold. So it is a clay mold itself that you would press clay soft clay into it and then create many many figurines this is a figurine of a female figure we can see that um that her pubic triangle is emphasized and that she holds um she holds what is probably you know some sort of food item and so what she this uh, this sort of object would sometimes referred to as you know female figurines of this type are sometimes referred to as fertility figurines which isn't really um as nuanced maybe an idea as we need but um we can see that if you take a material that is associated with creation and you 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 use iconography that is associated with creation and abundance and all those things. And then the process itself of molding something is intuitively connected to replication and creation. That something as simple as a small clay female figurine could have three levels of power and associ associated with it, making it um, you know, an even more valuable votive or an even more valuable offering. And so it, it challenges us to kind of think maybe a little bit differently about objects that at first glance we might not, we might not. Um, we can go to the next slide. So I'm, I'm closing today with another one of my favorite objects in the exhibition. And um, here we have a brick. Um, you guys are now very familiar with what a mud brick looks like. Um, and this is, again, a mud brick which comes from ancient Babylon. You also now are very familiar with the fact that the stamped inscription, cuneiform inscription that you see in the center is that which um, sort of is an homage to Nebuchadnezzar II. But when we were in Berlin and going through, you know, <laughs> hundreds of drawers of fragments, when I opened this drawer, the drawer with this fragment, I just started laughing because, of course, what you see here is that through the king's royal inscription, a little dog has run through the, the brick field and 
his paw is impressed now in that, you know, very impressive inscription. And the reason that I love this piece so much outside of the fact that who doesn't love a naughty dog is the fact that it really drives home for us that in the ancient world in particular, but in many periods, you have this sort of big narrative of the king and monument, monumental construction and all of these things. But what's there, but maybe just beneath the surface and sometimes harder to access is the story of regular people in the ancient world, people with naughty dogs and crying children and all of the things that we experience today. And that to me is so important that we don't forget that just because we're separated from these people by thousands of years and thousands of miles, we still are very connected to the sorts of experiences they had. Um, and so that's what we'll close with today. And I don't know if we have any time for questions, but I think we may have time for a couple, a couple questions. So again, thank you, thank you for um, joining us today. Hi, everyone again. Thank you, Claire, for bringing us to the galleries and a fascinating story uh, to Babylon and back. Um, I want to quickly shout out that a few of the artifacts that Claire went over in her PowerPoint are also featured on our social media page. We've been doing a sort of virtual object histories post every Wednesday to give a little bit of a longer story on some of the beautiful artifacts in this ex exhibition, which we're very grateful to our lenders. Um, for leaving them with us for a little while. Uh, so if I think eventually there'll be a slide that comes up that shows all of our social media handles and Facebook and Instagram and Twitter at I saw I S A W N Y U. Uh, so follow us on all those and you'll get sort of behind the scenes, not necessarily behind the scenes, but interesting anecdotes about all the different artifacts. Uh, so without further ado, I'll uh, start answering. I'll look to the questions. Uh, I do think that Claire already answered sort of Gary Kazin's question about um, the Ishtar Gate from the being from Pergmon Museum in Berlin, though our lion is not. Uh, Claire, if you want to quickly answer where our lion is from. Yeah, sure. Um, so what happened was, as I said, the, the Ishtar Gate itself had um, the Shushu dragons and bulls on them, on it the processional way had these 120 lions. When the, when the, when the museum sought to reconstruct the, um, the Ishtar Gate and processional way, they dispersed some of the lions so that they could be in different collections throughout the world. So there are lion panels in different parts of the world. Uh, of course, there are many in Iraq, um, but the one that we borrowed comes from the Metropolitan Museum. And um, so that one, that one, but there's one um, in Detroit, there's one at RISD. Um, you know, you find them, you find, you find these lions prowling here and there. And it's, um, it was because they were dispersed by the museum. <laughs> I love that idea of lions prowling the city right now. Uh, sorry to do another shout out, but if you check out our Instagram and Twitter today, uh, you'll see the, our Ishtar Lion um, post up and we're kind of doing a challenge to everyone if you want to use the hashtag, I saw Ishtar's lion at home and do a recreation. We have some already from our community of people putting their cats in front of brick, wall, brick walls or, or even their dogs or even uh, other creatures that can look like mushushu. So if you guys wanna sort of get involved with that, check us out on social media. And I'll go to the next question now. Uh, this is kind of an important question um, from the anonymous attendee. When will this exhibit be running physically through at ISA? This is presuming the pandemic ends within the near future. That's a complicated question, but Claire, if you wanna quickly. So, um Obviously, you know, we, we really, um, this exhibition was to be open through um, essentially the end of May. Um, and now um, we, we have had to close the galleries. Um, we hope to, um, unfortunately these aren't our objects, so we have to give them back. Um, and so we plan to probably deinstall the exhibition in August. Our hope is that it will be safe and possible for us to open the galleries sometime before then, maybe even if just for very briefly, so people could come, those people who didn't get an opportunity to see it could come, but um, 
we just uh, we just can't say now if that's going to be possible. But we will keep everyone updated on our website and on social media um, if that is possible. Um, another quick question from Stephanie Pearson. Were the other city gates of Babylon also made with glazed blue bricks like the Ishtar gates? That's a great question. And um, we do not know, it does not seem so. Um, so we have, the, there were other parts of the city, the palace and other parts of the city, which certainly incorporated um, glazed decoration and that were, that were excavated at the time of the gate. However, it doesn't seem that the other, um, that the other gates were. Um, it, one, one, you know, suggestion about why that might have been was the fact that this was an important sort of ceremonial ritual um, way to come into the city. And so, but you know, it's, 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 a, it's sort of an open question. <laughs> But you're, you know, why, why didn't we talk about all the other gates? There are, you know, I believe there are eight in total. So good question. Uh, there's actually a lot more questions than I realized. Um, so I'm going to just kind of go through it as they came in. Um, Linda G asked if there will be more excavations done at Babylon, which I think a few people asked questions relating to archaeology. Specifically, how long, Linda also asked, how long did the excavations last originally? So if you want to talk a little bit about um, the actual archaeology at the site, ongoing, past. Sure. Um, the site itself has a fascinating history, which I would encourage anybody to sort of go deeper in that, um, you know, there is a pre, of course, there's a, there's a history of excavation or at least activity at the site before 1899 when the DOG began to work there because basically from the time that Babylon existed, these bricks were valuable building materials and so people were taking them from the city in order to build new structures. And so for, for quite a while, I mean, hundreds, almost a thousand years, the site of Babylon was used essentially as a brick mine to, um, to use for other structures. So that's one sort of type of activity at the site. The German excavations happened there from 1899 to 1917. And after that, of course, some international teams have been involved throughout, um, you know, up until, up until today when um, you know teams from all different countries work um, on the site in one way or another and actually just as of um, 2019 the site was named a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So um, today um, there's been a great deal of work done um, on the site to um, you know clarify the walls um, but it also you know of course the site of Babylon has also been engaged in the political history of um, of Iraq and other, you know, and other sorts of parts of the world. And so it's a fascinating, you know, the sort of modern history of, of this site is, you know, maybe in some ways as fascinating as it's ancient, even though, of course, as an ancient person, we think the ancient's always more interesting, but. <laughs> Painfully true. Uh, a couple of questions also about, uh, this kind of goes a little bit further back, but again, the, the storyline of, of Ishtar Gate itself, um, both Paul and Roy White ask about the history of Ishtar Gate. So what happened to the Ishtar Gate? Um, it looks like it was, uh, Paul asked, it looks like it was abandoned in antiquity. If so, why did that happen? How did the gate become buried? So there's sort of, you know, not necessarily the fall, but the fall of the, uh, the Ishtar Gate of Babylon. So, so Babylon, um, you know, Babylon itself had experienced sort of the vicissitudes of history as, as everywhere else does. And so, even one of the reasons the Ishtar Gate was built even is sort of in response to um, Sennacherib's almost complete destruction of the city in 689 BCE. So, you know, um, over time as the empire rose and fell, Babylon's did as well. And when Babylon sort of starts to decline, What's interesting is that again, the, the site lives on as an important um, as an important place again because of how valuable these resources, these building resources were, and there's that. So there's a story of sort of the actual site of Babylon, and then there's the story of ideas around Babylon and how they filter through ancient texts, how they filter through biblical texts, 
And that's what I was referring to when I said sort of the site itself gains its own, um, it's sort of, there's its real history or its, or its, its uh, physical history, and then the history, its history in sort of the minds of, of the world. And so, um, so, you know, as the physical remains of the city sort of decline, its, its power in the imagination of the world really doesn't. Um, but maybe they sort of diverge, and maybe that's where some of the misunderstandings come around this um, this material. Hopefully, that answers your question a little bit. Or it's a long story. There's a lot more here, <laughs> I should say. I think um, it's fair to say that you know we could probably have this conversation ongoing for many hours. Um, our next questions, we go back to some of the stuff that's actually on the Ishtar Gate. So um, both Casey and uh, Casey Ebro and Stephanie. Costa de Nova, um, ask about the animals on the Ishtar Gate. What was the significance of the bulls and lions in ancient Babylonian religion? Um, and why exactly it is called the Ishtar Gate? So we go back to some kind of explanation of, of Ishtar Gate and the animals on it. Okay, so um, the Ishtar Gate, again, is, is, a, is the entrance, one of the entrances to the city of Babylon. It might make you think that Ishtar is the major deity in Babylon, and that, that would be a reasonable assumption, but it's not. Um, Marduk, who was sort of the, um, at the head of the pantheon, was the sort of um, deity of the, the sort of, this was sort of seen as the seat of Marduk. So Marduk's creature is the bull. So in part, that's one of the reasons why we see the bull on the, um, on the gate itself. But of course, also, Bulls are um, a very important and popular image in ancient Middle Eastern um, iconography, obviously for their power. Oftentimes bulls are, um, you know, we may not think of them as, as powerful as lions, but we often see um, images with bulls in contest with lions. You know, they're both extremely fierce, extremely powerful creatures. And bulls are sometimes associated more with sort of the um, the built world, you know, um, and lions, the wild world. So two different types of power um, interacting with one another. Um, so that's, that's one answer. Um, the Mushushu is maybe the least, um, as I said, Mushushu is, is a less popular figure when we see, you know, we, we see bulls and lions all over cylinder seals, all over different sorts of amulets and things like that. Mushushus are a little more rare, but they do definitely have this association of protection that comes from having all of these creatures, the powerful aspects of these creatures in one. Um, and we do see them in domestic contests and elsewhere. Why is it called the Ishtar Gate? That's related to the lions in part. So the lion is sort of the familiar of Ishtar, the goddess Ishtar, who is um, the goddess of sort of love and war. Um, the Ishtar Gate is called the Ishtar Gate because you say, well, you know, why isn't it called the Marduk Gate then? Because they're bulls on the actual gate. Um, the Ishtar Gate is called the Ishtar Gate actually coming from its ancient name. So the, the street and the gate itself have different names, but one of the, but all of them are associated with the goddess Ish, Ishtar. So, um, so the Ishtar Gate, one of the names of it is, um, in the ancient period is, Ishtar expels her enemies. So her protective and sort of bellicose nature is really emphasized not only through the sort of hyper replication of her animal in the, in the lion, but also because that's the actual ancient name of the gate itself. So its association with Ishtar comes from the ancient world. Hopefully that. Thank you, Claire. Uh, so another question, which is interesting, and I think kind of follows off of that, um, is to briefly talk about Babylon at the time period, its significance in the Middle East, why it became so um, significant, if there were any contemporary written accounts of what it felt like to enter Babylon through the Ishtar Gate. Um, so a little something about what Babylon in antiquity and, and what people experienced there. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, what's interesting is that although there are lots of classical texts and things that refer to the city of Babylon, um, we don't have outside references 
that seem to relate to the gate itself. However, we do have statements made by Nebuchadnezzar about what he wanted the gate to do. And he talks about how he had the gate made in these glittering, again, lapis lazuli, he, he, and that he wanted it to sort of um, instill wonder in all people. He, he, you know, so that notion of wonder or awe is something that was intended. And of course, Nebuchadnezzar tells us that he realized it, um, you know, but in terms of sort of something, maybe, maybe you're wondering if there's something like a, like a traveler's account of having gone and, and entered the city of Babylon through the gate. And they say, we don't have that. That's one of the reasons why it's so interesting for us to think about this in experiential terms. And one thing that I just want to reference is that we probably is difficult for us to imagine is that when you are entering the city, part of the, part of the fact uh, or part of the benefit, let's say, of it being glazed is that light is playing off these surfaces at all times. And so if you can imagine moving down this, this um, processional way with light glittering off the surfaces of these lions and people moving around you, you know, there's a very dynamic experience. And it may have even felt like these, you know, these figures were moving and walking with you. So we kind of have to wrap up because we're nearing the end of our hour. Um, but I have, I, I, I'm gonna kind of answer, we're gonna answer two questions really quickly or sort of two topics really quickly. One is a simple question. Um, is a translation of the glass making recipe available? Yes, um, they, um, yes, they both come from the British Museum. And um, if you go online, you will see a catalog of all of the, uh, on our website, you'll see all of the objects. And there you can find, um, you can find the number of the object and there is, um, there are translations of those texts. Um, also in our catalog, we have a really interesting article by a scholar who talks about the many levels of meaning of the, um, of the, uh, glass recipe texts. Um, and that's another really nice way to sort of look at that question. So um, both, both of those are available. And if you want to order the catalog that has a lot of this information, uh, I think you'd have to actually email us, but you can buy it online from Claire Princeton, Princeton uh, Princeton's our publisher. And, and there's uh, also some available on Amazon and things like that. Um, I see one other, um, one other question that I just can answer really briefly, sort of maybe close, or well, actually when, um, we don't know if the gate was used only for ceremonial purposes or whether it was used in a more daily way, we're just not sure. Um, we know it was used as part of New Year's rituals, um, but we're not sure about, you know, whether or not everybody came in through that gate or not. Um, but the other question is, is what do you see if you go to Babylon today? And um, I think that's a good place to, to close. Um, so not only, you know, first, um, at the National Museum, um, there's a tremendous amount of material that comes from Babylon in Iraq, in Baghdad. However, if you go to the site of Babylon now, you will see all of those um, subterranean walls. And again, as it has recently been named the UNESCO World Heritage Site, even more um, sort of funding has gone to, to create that as a cultural heritage site. Um, but the, of course, the city of Babylon had a very long history, and so you'll, you actually see um, even more moments in its, its history than just the, the piece that we, that we chose to discuss. And, um, you know, so, it, so it, it, is a, it, is a, it is an important site to visit today if anyone is, is, is able. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that. Thank you, Claire. That was actually the, the question I was going to end on. So perfect. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming today. Please email me. My email is included in this slide here. If you have any questions, um, I'll connect you to whoever can answer it best. Uh, and please follow us on social media. And whenever, if ever, whenever we can open the galleries again, whether it's with this exhibition or our next exhibition, uh, we hope to see all of you there. And um, or at our lectures when they begin again as well. I hope everyone has a happy Wednesday and uh, thank you, Claire. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye everyone. Bye. -bye.